ready to go. So, uh, Wayne, week three, thank you. Okay. Well, <clears throat> welcome back, everybody. Let me uh, go to uh, the share screen so we can get on to some uh, slides. Is that working for everyone? I'm hoping so. Um, yeah, it's good. yeah, we're back. We're good. Okay, we're uh, we're back at uh, week three. Um, please put in what you're drinking. I am having tonight having a tea punch from Martinique, using the uh, a, a rum JM from uh, Martinique, uh, 100 proof. They, I think the bottle normally sell as uh, 80 proof in the U.S., but I brought back some 100 proof last time I was in uh, Martinique, so. It stands up well to ice. It does not take any grief from ice. It's, it's very nice. So uh, anyway, this week three, uh, let me just uh, recap a bit what we've uh, been doing. We started off week one, rum history. So we're looking at 300 plus years of rum history. Uh, I make my argument that rum is a new world drink made by colonists for colonists. It's more American than bourbon or tequila. Tequila has a pretty good case, but it's a, it, it's, it's a great one. Uh, and then yet last week we did rum production, just looking at all the different ways you can make rum and how that results in different flavor profiles for each uh, channel that you do uh, rum production on. And this week we will be looking at rum consumption, the fun part, the drinking of rum, uh, what kind of rums are out there, how to drink it, who's drinking it, things like that. So um, we'll, uh, We'll get right into that. Here's here's tonight's general breakdown, just to give you a little bit of overview. If you if you need to stop and go make yourself a drink at some point, uh, you'll see where we're where you're dipping out, where you're coming back. We're gonna start out just talking about rum rum classification, basically as, as a genus and species. Uh, lots of different kinds of rums, and they taste very different. Why is that? And how do we think about that? How do we talk to people about the fact that rums are all wildly divergent? Next, to look at some of the rum trends, sort of overview of what's going on with rum these days, how it is being marketed, how it is being consumed, how it's being sold. Uh, I'm gonna touch on some notable rum distilleries, uh, three to be precise, three that I think would be great to put on anybody's bucket list if you wanna go travel and visit some rum distilleries and see what's going on out there. Sort of represent three different styles of rum uh, as well. I'm gonna touch on some rum cocktails, What I mean, we're, we talk a lot about drinking rum neat and straight, but uh, rum is made for cocktails. And uh, I'm gonna talk about three of the essential rum cocktails. I think everybody should know how to make uh, competently. Then where do you get this rum? Where to rum at? Um, it, we're, we're talking about a lot of cool rums. Uh, a lot of the ones we're talking about that are the coolest are hard to find, they're hard to access. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, where they are. And this is largely going to be uh, focused uh, for a New Orleans-centric group, which I assume that we are, and that those who will be uh, seeing the recording are, uh, where, where, where you can get good rum, both at bars as well as at retail. Then I'm going to finish up with uh, my personal pick, five bottles that uh, if I were cast adrift on an island and told I had 10 minutes to gather up five bottles to take with me, these are the five that I think I would take. Not necessarily the, the best bottles in the world, but the ones that give me the, the most comfort. Um, so let's, let's jump right into our, our rum classification, rum categories, uh, which brings us to rum's eternal problem, uh, which is that rum's diversity, which is its strength, is also its weakness. Let's talk about that. Uh, rum tastes, as uh, I'm sure most of you know, and as we've discussed in this uh, three-week class, is wildly divergent, wildly different. One, one rum can taste completely different than the other. A light and crisp Puerto Rican rum doesn't even seem to be in the same genus as a funky Jamaican rum or a grassy agricultural rum from Martinique. Um, never mind the same species, they just don't seem to be in the same family. Some rums are sweet, some are dry, some can be white, they can be amber or gold, some even black in the case of Gosling's or the Crucian's black strap rum. I mean, all of this makes it really fun, really fun category to explore. There's, you never know what you're going to get when you pick up a bottle, uh, but it's also a weakness because you never know what you're going to get when you pick up a bottle. If someone who's new to the rum cat, you know, just randomly picks up a super funky Jamaican rum or a super grassy agricole rum from uh, the French islands, they're going to think, wow, 
rum is weird. I don't need to buy that again. So rum has this appearance of seeming to lack consistency. And it's easy to get the impression that anything goes when you're making a rum. You can make it t taste any way you want, any kind of flavor you want. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard for, for rum to go out and market itself. Um, it, it appears to some that there's just no rules when you make rum. You can do whatever you want when you're a rum producer. But I think the uh, problem may actually be that there are too many rules, that there's too many options, um, too many jurisdictions for rum. And rum is made in uh, dozens of countries. Um, a lot of them in the uh, West Indies and Caribbean as the central map shows some of the rum producing countries, but the map on the lower left shows where rum is made around the world. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the less familiar rums that come from uh, elsewhere, from the non-Caribbean area, which has the richest association with it. Uh, but each of these countries, each of these islands, each of these jurisdictions, they have their own regulations, their own requirements for what you have to do to be able to call it rum. Puerto Rico, for instance, we mentioned this last week, uh, rum has to sit for at least three years in a vat, in a, in a tank, uh, in order to be uh, called rum. You can't put rum on the label unless it sits in a tank for three years and let some of the more noxious gases uh, dispel. The uh, rum agricole from Martinique has to be made from sh fresh sugar cane. Uh, a certain species of sugar cane has to abide by another set of rules, the amount of proof that it comes out as, uh, the amount of time it has to rest, including the type of column. It has to be a column still. You can't use a pot still in Martinique. Uh, so there's lots of regulations there. So you end up with uh, a very different flavor profiles uh, because every place has its own traditions and its own uh, rules and regulations. You contrast that to some other popular spirits that we're all familiar with. For instance, bourbon, scotch, Canadian whiskey, Irish whiskey, tequila, cognac, armagnac. All of those are made in one jurisdiction. Um, and, are there, you know, and that's by international agreement. You can't make a tequila in the US. You can't make an armagnac or cognac or a scotch outside of those countries and call it that. <clears throat> it, um, it's all you know, related to international, uh, international treaties, international trade agreements, uh, and the like. So that means every drop of all those those liquors uh, are made under identical set of rules and guidelines, which are reinforced by either regional or local uh, traditions, as well as government. So you end up with a certain range. And bourbon has to be made with at least 51% corn, has to be aged in new oak barrels. There's, there's a, a range of, so your, your bourbons, they can taste different, but it's within a certain limit. Same with Canadian, same with Irish, uh, same with cognac. Uh, they have their own regulations, so there's, there's a limit. Rum, not so much. It's all over the place. It can, it, you know, as I said, it's different in Puerto Rico, Cuba, Guyana, Guatemala. They all have their own regulations for rum, so you end up with something that comes out that no one's quite sure no one's quite sure when they go to a liquor store if they're unfamiliar with it when they pick up a bottle of rum what it's going to taste like. Rum sold in the United States has to meet just a, a pretty scant handful of federal requirements to be labeled rum. It must be made from sugar cane or its byproducts which of course includes molasses and it has to adhere to the local rules defining rum for where it's made. So the U.S. regulation is basically you can call it rum here if you call it rum there. If where you make it, it's called rum, we'll call it rum too. And what the stipulation is made from sugar cane. You can't make it from sugar beets or, or maple syrup or something, call it rum, no matter where it's from. It has to be from sugar cane. So to understand the problem that rum faces as far as categorization, it's good to think of uh, sort of the rum versus the whiskey comparison. To, to return to this sort of taxonomy argument, genus and species, uh, whiskey is a genus, uh, and bourbon, rye, scotch, Canadian, Irish are all sort of subspecies within that. Uh, all are made from grain and all uh, have a history and geography that sort of conspire that they each evolved to have a distinct taste. Scotch doesn't taste like Irish, Irish doesn't taste like Canadian, Canadian doesn't taste like bourbon. Uh, and consumers have evolved as well to refer to each of these species as if they were something distinct. I don't think anybody goes to a bar today and says, I'll just take a whiskey. Some places they do maybe. Uh, but for the most part, I think people have been trained and through, through time and tradition, didn't know that say, I'll take a shot of Irish whiskey or I'll take a bourbon or, or, or by brand, Jack Daniels or Jim Beam, which is another, another issue. But people ordered by genus, I mean by species rather than by genus. If everything was just referred to as whiskey, 
Uh, you might have someone say, I'll take a whiskey, and someone gives them a uh, super smoky Laphroaig scotch, and they decide that all whiskey is horrible, and they would dismiss bourbon and Canadian whiskey and everything else because they've had whiskey and they don't like it. Uh, it's like you know someone getting an agricole rum and deciding they don't like the whole category of rum because they don't like agricole. So rum has not evolved and become specialized in the same way that, that whiskey have. It's, it's a little bit behind the curve on that. I think that's a, a large part of what's harming it. It's, uh, yeah, it's all rum. People go to a, a bar and they'll say, I'll take, I'll take a rum. So, so where they wouldn't say, I'll just take a whiskey. Uh, so rum is still a way to go. I think getting to the level where consumers think of it in terms of uh, species instead of a genus. And I want to review some of the ways that people have uh, subdivided rum. Um, you know, th there, there's an effort, there's an effort in the rum industry to try to fix this. Uh, I think a lot of the rum producers realize that this is a problem, uh, that they need to have some sort of consistency, some sort of um, basis for people to decide on that doesn't confuse them all that much. So there's, there's an effort to push it. And over time, there's been a, uh, attempts to try to split rum into different categories. I'm going to go over some of these. Two of these are older ones, I think, in less helpful ways of discussing rum. And one of them's a more recent uh, approach that I think is a little bit more helpful, but still has some, some issues. Um, so for about a century, you've seen this categorization. It's, there's white rum and there's amber rum. Uh, people talk about that pretty uh, regularly. Sometimes amber rum is referred to as gold rum or dark rum. It's easy, it's visible, you can see it on your, your store shelf when you go in there. The consumer understands there's white rum and there's amber rum. Uh, the assumption typically is, is that the white rum is unaged. It comes off the still. Maybe it'll sit in a steel tank for a little bit, but then it goes into the bottle and it doesn't have any of the influence of wood uh, or oak to it. It tends to be a little bit fresher and zestier with a little bit more like citrus peel, maybe a little after notes of something antiseptic to a white rum. Uh, and then there's the amber rums, which are aged uh, as, as if they spent time in a barrel and they picked up the, the color of the wood, as well as some of the flavors from the barrel, which we talked about last week, such as vanilla and butterscotch from the sugars in the wood that caramelized when, the, uh, when they were toasted or charred. They might also, uh, while they're in the barrel, pick up some deeper flavors like cherry and ripe pineapple, uh, these are the compounds that emerge as the distillate interacts with the oxygen that gets into the barrel uh, through, the, uh, through the wood. Uh, over time, it will take on uh, more interesting and rich flavors. So general perception is way to be younger, crisper, gold rum, amber rum will be aged and a little bit deeper and uh, richer tasting. But I think this categorization is uh, as many of you know, falls, falls short. It's a little bit too ham-handed. Uh, a Martinique white rum, for instance, has no relationship with a white Puerto Rican rum that anyone can tell, or a white overproof Jamaican rum. Very different rums uh, across the white category. Uh, and this is further complicated by the fact that some of the white rums that you can get today are, have actually been aged in wood uh, and then filtered to take the color out. Uh, one example, this is the Crucian uh, rum, the basic white rum from Crucian in the Virgin Islands uh, is aged in wood and then filtered to take the color out, but it still has a lot of the, the flavor of wood uh, in there. And some of the, uh, some also some unaged rums are car colored with caramel to give them this golden or amber color. Uh, they, they're allowed to do that, as we mentioned last week, you know, about two and a half percent to a bottle uh, without declaring it on the label. So you can add coloring, you can add sweetener in there. So you can make, you can basically make it imitate the look and to a lesser degree the taste of an aged rum and an unaged one. Uh, so it's, it'll be amber, but it really doesn't have the characteristics of a sophisticated and mature aged rum that's actually spent uh, several years in a barrel. So white rum, amber rum, easy to remember, easy to see, not very helpful. Another categorization that I think we've seen a fair amount of in the uh, uh, last few years has been this. And this is, uh, I mean, I've been responsible for this. I've been involved in seminars where we talked about these three different styles. And it is helpful uh, uh, to some degree. It's one that I learned early on and, and a number of people have. British style rums, the English rums, they uh, tend to be a little bit denser. They often involve uh, pot stills that they're made in so that uh, you have a, a heavier, fuller, richer 
rum that's associated with the English style. That includes the Jamaican rum, most notably, which is most famous for being dense and heavy, uh, but also Barbados, Trinidad, Guyana, also with the, the British style heritage and production techniques. The Spanish tends to be a little lighter and cleaner or much lighter and cleaner. Uh, they're generally produced, uh, at least in more recent times, on a column still so that there's, it's easier to strip out a lot of the flavors and leave it more clean and pure. Uh, Puerto Rico is really the category leader in the Spanish style rums or what have been called Spanish style rums. But also in Q, you know, Bacardi is, uh, produces much of their output in Puerto Rico. Take a sip. Um, so Bacardi is, you know, based in, in Puerto Rico. They also have production elsewhere, but uh, this very light, almost a, almost a vodka quality in a lot of the white rums. Even the aged rums tend to be very uh, brisk and light. So the, that, that sort of tends to be the Spanish style uh, rum. And finally, there's the French style rum. And we talked last week about agricole rums made from fresh pressed sugar cane use, juice. They're more vegetal, they're more grassy tasting, they're fresher, especially the white. Once you age them, they tend to take on more of the quality of the oak, so they tend to merge a little bit more with uh, either the English or the Spanish style. Uh, but there is a definite difference in the, the French style. So this, this is, a, I mean, this is a more helpful approach than splitting up by color because color can be um, uh, manipulated so easily. Uh, but this still falls short in a lot of the nuance. I think it fails to encompass some of the range of rum. For instance, the uh, Spanish style would include both Santa Teresa rum from Venezuela, which is uh, uh, it's a heavy bodied rum. It tastes like it has more in common with Guyana than with Cuba, which is next door. Uh, and Crucian rum for the Virgin Islands would technically be a British style rum, yet it, seems to me often to be more like a British style rum, a lot lighter and uh, more refreshing, uh, less dense, heavy notes, less of that sort of honey, caramel, butterscotch uh, feel to it. So, and, and then there's the question, you've got these three, but now we've got all these American rums that have been coming out. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But there, uh, there seems to be a merging flavor profile of American rums, uh, drier and crisper than many of uh, any of these Caribbean style rums. And a lot of that's by design. The American rum producers seem to be building a bridge to bourbon drinkers and, and they're playing up the oak and the dryness. They're hoping to shake off the comment that, oh, rum is too sweet. So this, this categorization, it's a lot of blurring, there's a lot of gray areas, there's a lot of overlap between them, and then there's a whole new category that's coming in. I suppose you could go with four categories, go English, Spanish, French, and American, but I don't think that's uh, all that helpful. So those are the two older approaches. The white and amber has really been around for about a century. The English, Spanish, and French has been around for maybe 20 years. That I've been here. That's been talked about much more frequently. Uh, and then in the last five years, there's been another type of categorization that, that, that's come up. And this is called the Gargano classification. Uh, it's a more recent proposal. It's named after the guy who created it, a guy named Luca Gargano, who's a uh, an importer of rums based in Italy. He's been doing this for quite a while. I'll talk about him a little bit more later. But he worked with uh, Richard Seal, who is the owner and uh, distiller at Foursquare Distillery on Barbados in developing this uh, other classification system in 2015. And the idea was to highlight uh, and recognize those methods that are used to make rum. So instead of where it's from, it's how, it, how it's made, really focusing on the production and a, uh, uh, a very granular level. In part, this is to help consumers understand the flavor profile they'll be tasting. So ostensibly under the Gargano classification, you can see what he refers to it as, and you'll have an idea of what it tastes like. Uh, but it's also to educate consumers about the more traditional methods of rum production with the idea that uh, they'll understand that traditional rum costs more to make, it takes a longer process, it's a slower process, it's a less efficient process, you get flavors out of it. Uh, and so then you, you'd understand why there might be a premium charge for it as opposed to somebody who's just making a a very industrial rum and then flavoring it to taste old and still trying to charge a premium price for it. This classification system would really break it down such that you have a better idea of where your rum is coming from 
and how it's made. It's a bit like, I think, the organic label on foods. You know, it's more expensive um, and it, it's more difficult to make than blasting a field with pesticides, uh, but it's better for the environment and so you'll pay a premium for it. I should say that no distillation method is better for the environment, so that's where the comparison breaks down, but it is a more expensive way of approaching uh, rums uh, rum production and so helping to understand how a rum is made help the consumer do uh, make decisions on what they want to buy. Anyway, here's the basic four categories. The Gargano system is uh, basically broke down to these uh, four. Pure single rum, single blended rum, traditional rum, and then rum. Uh, that's how they're looking for people to split things up. The uh, Let's dig a little bit deeper into that. Here's the, the, the classification system that they've got. The um, you can see, ignore the top line with the bottle brands, the, the no distillery statement, they're sort of putting people who are, they're, they're trying to create a category that will help you understand there's distillers who are doing their own, there's people who are buying from uh, distillers who are making good rums, and then there's those who are just, are brands that are buying rum on the, on the market from brokers and bottling it. Uh, that's the no distillery statement column, and they want all this to be distinguished uh, on the shelf. So if you go down below, you see uh, in the yellow boxes, there's the pure agricole, pure single agricole rum made from sugarcane juice and agricole rum uh, below that. If you look to the left of those, you'll see the still types. So the traditional one we talked last week about has, these are three basic substrates. You can make it from fresh sugarcane juice. You can make it from sugarcane syrup, which is sugarcane juice that's been boiled down, but the sugar has not been extracted from it for crystallization and sales. And then you can have it from molasses, which is the byproduct of the crystallization of sugar uh, in the sugar process. So those are the three substrates that you can make it from. And so, and then you have the st still types on the left, the matrix, you have a pot still, you have a blend of pot and uh, column still, like a two column, one or two column still. And then uh, the next one is just from a one or two column still. And the third one is from a, a much more uh, industrial four column or three or four column still production, which a lot of the big uh, operators have, such as Bacardi, uh, run on scales that make them look almost like uh, oil refineries. They're, they're massive. So we got it's getting warm. I'm up in Maine and there's mosquitoes coming back. Uh, I got warm today after a, a run of cold weather. So anyway, the uh, Classification, again, pure single rum, single, single blended rum, which would be a mix of going from the molasses ones, to the molasses column. Pure single rum, just made from molasses based, a run through a pot still and produced that way. A single blended rum would be a pot still and a column still blended together. So you get some of the denser, heavier flavors along with some of the lighter uh, aspects of it. I know in Traditionally, I mean, Mount Gay does this in Barbados, and I, I remember taking my first tour there about 15, 20 years ago, um, and the, the guy uh, was showing me the distillery, said, this is where we make our rum, and then he pointed to the pot still, which they had an old pot still there, and then he pointed to the big column still, there, and had a very modern column still there, he goes, and this is where we make our vapors. So they referred to them as rum and vapors. So the vapors was very clean and pure, uh, almost flavorless, and then you'd flavor it with the pot still rum. So that's a single blended rum. Traditional rum would be a one or two column still um, made out of uh, molasses or syrup. And then the more industrial one would just be rum. So you could label it as just rum if you're making it in a big industrial column. The no distillery statement over on the right is a little bit more refined. For those that are just buying bulk rum and rebottling it, they uh, propose that you could call it either blended rum or vatted rum, depending on whether you're making it uh, with some of the pot still rum for flavoring or whether you're using entirely uh, rum coming from a uh, column still. So that's the Gargano classification. It's, it's uh, as I said, it's uh, somewhat interesting in that it is going straight to the method of production. It's not talking about history or tradition or geography, where things come from. Uh, it's acknowledging the fact that people on all the islands are making rum all different ways. They are attempting uh, new things or experimenting or trying different stuff and some of those traditions are eroding so to refer to something as a 
uh, English or French style rum uh, is meaning less and less these days. This is seeming to get ahead of it. And as I said, also to educate consumers, educate rum drinkers that there is a tradition and heritage to rum making and it started with the pot still. Pot stills are not efficient. Pot stills have a lot of flavor. So if you see something advertised as a pure single rum, you have a pretty good idea of what kind of uh, flavor profile it's gonna have. A little denser, a little heavier, a little richer and bolder. Um, and it's gonna be more expensive uh, that way. So I think this is a, a reasonably good um, system. I think the, as far as the pros and cons go, I think it's accurate and a good forecaster of the taste profile. If I see any of those uh, in the green labels on a bottle, I think I would have a pretty good sense of what I was going to get out of it. But I'm, of course, I'm educated in this. I'm not sure for the general consumer is that helpful. It, this makes it, I think if, you, if we adapt to this categorization system, it would acknowledge you know, history and how rum is made and made it a little bit more resistant to marketing that hijacks the history and tradition and just is putting stuff out there, making stuff sound old, but it's actually just made in a massive industrial complex somewhere uh, out of molasses. The, um, I mean, this, this gives rum a lot, rum buyers a lot of information, I think, in a fairly compact way when they're shopping for rum. The downside on the cons is, uh, I mean, come on. Uh, I don't know the average consumer is ever going to embrace this. It's hard enough, I think, for many people to wrap their idea around, wait, there's a white and a dark rum? Uh, what the hell? I, I mean, this geekery might be just going a little too far, a little too complicated. It might be just for those of us who are in way too deep and can't find our way back out. Um, so to go back to the whiskey analogy, I think as you know, I was talking about how uh, whiskey has been referred to as a species, where in rum we're still referring to it as a, as a genus. I think as people become more educated by rum, the, the source of origin and the traditions that have emerged from there uh, will start to just sort of naturally serve as subclassifications, such as people talk about scotch, they know it's from Scotland, they know sort of what it's going to taste like. Irish whiskey, they know it's from Ireland, they have an idea what that's going to taste like. Canadian whiskey, they know where that's from. And they know generally how that's going to taste. It's going to be lighter uh, than most of the others. Uh, so they have different flavor profiles that are harnessed to an area, uh, even if it's a, a rough outline. I mean, Scotland has peated and unpeated whiskey. Those are completely different, but there's still a, a general Scotch profile. Um, I'm already seeing, uh, I think I'm starting to see folks now when, when I'm, I'm traveling, back when we could travel and uh, visited bar, rum bars and talked with people uh, sitting at the stool next to me. And people seem to understand now that there's a, there's a difference in a lot of these rums. They, they know and appreciate what they might call a Jamaican style rum or a Martinique style rum. Even a Guyana rum, there's a profile for that. So I think that might be, maybe is where we're headed uh, as people talking about things a little bit more geographically in, in their classifications. All I know is that nobody is going to be able to prescribe how we all talk about rum. This happens organically and naturally, just much as the evolution of scotch and bourbon and rye and Japanese whiskey have. Consumers will eventually decide how they want to classify it based on what's helpful and useful and prescriptive uh, uh, for them. All that we rum evangelists can do is really try to educate everyone as best we can as to rum production, rum uh, geography, things like that and let the categories emerge as they do and, and uh, fall into place. But I mean, that's, so that's a, a general overview of some of the classifications of rum, uh, historic and contemporary. How, you know, I'd be curious to know if you put in the comments, if you have a way that you think of rum uh, and to break it out. I imagine a lot of you are educated when it comes to rum so that you know these different styles and, and varieties, but maybe think about how to, when you talk to friends who know nothing about rum, who might only know about Bacardi or Captain Morgan, uh, how to discuss rum that makes sense uh, for them. I, it's, this is, uh, we're at an interesting pivotal point. Like I said, we're moving from a genus to species in rum, and nobody knows exactly what the species are right now because there's so much happening in the field. So speaking of uh, happening in the field, let's um, move on to the next section and talk about some of the, the rum trends that are emerging. Um, I'll talk a little bit less. This is, uh, I guess we're going from Plato to Aristotle, a little bit less abstract and talking theoretically about rum categories and look more at what's actually happening uh, 
with rum trends uh, in the marketplace right now. So in talking about rum, it's, you know, it's good to remember there, there are craft and artisan rums that we've been, that people like me, we geek out over. We love to just compare and tasting notes and, and compare the difference between a rum that was made in 2011 and one that was made in 2013. But there's plenty of, uh, it's a very small bit of rum. This is, this is the artisanal market and the mass market. The artisanal market is just a tiny little fraction above the surface. The mass market of rum exists down below. Uh, and it's, I mean, the rarefied fancy rums are just a few quarts in, the, in an ocean of rum. Uh, so remember that as we talk tonight about these better rums, and I will circle back around to that because, I mean, we don't want to sit around here and talk about Bacardi and, and Captain Morgan and, and uh, some of the less interesting rums, the $10 bottles of rum right now. We want to talk about things that are a little bit more fascinating, complex, and sophisticated. Uh, but just remember that it, for every bottle of Foursquare Collector's Edition rum from Barbados, there were thousands of bottles of Bacardi sold. And there are even more you know, bottles, thousands of, or millions of bottles uh, of less distinguished rum sold uh, as well. Some that you may not have heard of. Uh, some of these uh, folks, even even some of the, um, the, the, the smaller, more distinguished places like Foursquare, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more, which produces some absolutely exceptional rums, their bread and butter is selling mass market rums. They have a massive production facility in Barbados. And a lot of what they sell gets put in the ship tankers and shipped over to Europe, goes to Amsterdam, where it's uh, a broker over there will sell it to others to, to repackage and blend and do what they want with it. Nobody knows it's coming from Foursquare Distillery in Barbados, but we know for Foursquare about it, it's some of its high quality rums. But even, uh, even some of the artisanal places are producing massive amounts of, uh, of, of mass market rum. So, Here's a, here's a chart uh, from last year, most recent figures. These are cases, million cases, nine liter cases, which means 12 bottles to 750 milliliters, or do the math on the 1.75 uh, uh, liter cases. But it's, uh, these are the ones how they've been selling around the country. I'm, I'm willing to bet a great many of you have not heard of Tan Bue. Um, which out of the Philippines, uh, the largest rum producer in the world, uh, producing 20 million cases a year of rum, almost none of it making it to uh, the United States. The, um, they've been making rum in the Philippines since the 1850s, and uh, it's just, it just sort of stays in Asia. It has not made it out there. Um, I've, seen it, I've seen it listed on the Total Wines website. I'm not sure if it's available at Metairie uh, yet, but it's, I think they are starting to look at a little bit more assertive marketing in the U.S., but I mean, what's the need if they're moving 20 million cases and not even troubling themselves with the U.S., they don't really need to, uh, to bother with that much more. I mean, Bacardi, number two, 17.8 million cases. Captain Morgan, which I think we're all familiar with, Spiced Rum, 11.9 million cases. And then you've got one that I bet most of you haven't heard of, McDowell's number one celebration, which is made in India. Um, again, another huge market that is um, not really that well known. The, um, this, and this, and some of the other ones there, you, you know, Havana Club, you're probably familiar with, but may not have tasted. It's not available in the United States on account of trade uh, ban dating back to, uh, 19, I think it's 1962. The trade with uh, Cuba was banned because of uh, communism and Fidel Castro. And uh, Havana Club is in, in the early, late 1990s, I believe it was, was bought by Pernod Ricard, a French company, which has upped its distribution. So it's the number one selling rum in Italy. It's, that sells very well in England and Canada. Uh, not available here. It's, that's a quite decent rum. Then some of the others. I frankly have never heard of Bozkov, thinking it's a Russian rum. I don't know. Um, and then Appleton kind of just over a million cases a year uh, from Jamaica, which I think people have heard of. So this is, this is to give you an idea of just sort of the context of where we fit in. But even with the 1 million cases a year of Negrito, which is from the French islands, uh, the craft distillers that we'll be talking about, if any of them are moving close to 100,000 cases a year, it would be a remarkable thing. I think many of them are more in the 
10, 20,000 cases a year. Still making them profit at it, but at much smaller scale. So I just want to present this as a way to uh, talk about uh, uh, the rub market overall and what's happening with it and you know, what, what, what's going on. The, um, and of this, a lot of this is not aged. A lot of this is just white rum. Uh, it has not seen a barrel. It's uh, hugely popular in drinks, you know, used in drinks and bars at home, the daiquiri and the mojito, goes into rums and Coke all the time. It's just the, you know, it's, it's much cheaper to produce an unaged rum because you don't have to let it sit around in a barrel for years while it develops some uh, uh, sophistication. So the rum gets moved out. So white rums among, on all these categories, I don't know what the figures are, but I'm guessing the white rums are gonna account for at least 75, 80% on each of those bars, uh, that maybe some aged rum. I think Havana Club, uh, Havana Club was a lot of white as well. But it's uh, it's it's the white rums are, are are big. They're starting to stumble a little bit, uh, at least in the United States. People are not interested in the bottom shelf rums, the cheaper rums. There is a movement towards premiumization. I guess is the phrase in the marketing world, where consumers are willing to pay more for a higher quality product and higher quality means aged in the case of rum. I think we're seeing this in every industry. People are moving from gas station coffee to Starbucks, from McDonald's to steak and shake. And I just don't see that trend changing. So I think the white rum's gonna start to diminish, but it'll be picked up by premium rum. So the volume of, of rum might start dropping off, but the uh, amount of rum sales will likely go up because uh, people buy fewer $10 bottles of white rum, but they might buy more $25 or $30 bottles of, of aged rum. So note, I mentioned in passing Captain Morgan, number three on this list, selling about 12 million cases a year. And uh, spiced rum is a huge category. In fact, this is a figure that's uh, still a little bit surprising to me. This is not surprising. It's a little dismaying, maybe. More than half of all rum sold in the United States by volume, not by price. Uh, is spiced or flavored rums. Um, that is, that's what moves in the mass market. We talked about white rums moving globally, but in the US it's spiced and, and uh, flavored rums are a huge uh, thing. And spiced rums, they're not just for the callow and the young. There's actually a rich history of spiced rums in the West Indies. People would traditionally, people living on the islands would traditionally add a little sugar and some spices like nutmeg, allspice, uh, manila, cinnamon, put them in a bottle uh, and with some cheap or homemade rum and uh, it, it takes the edge off. It makes it much more palatable and it was uh, it, 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 it was a traditional way of, of drinking rum in the islands and it spread into the more commercial realm as well. So that now you have a whole market for, for spiced rum. Many of these spiced rums, my main complaint with them is that they tend to be just vanilla bombs. They just, you sip them, it just tastes like you're having some vanilla extract or some, some other stuff uh, in there. Nothing wrong with vanilla, but can we be a little bit more nuanced and sophisticated uh, a bit? There are some, uh, there are some good ones out there. The, um, well, I'll, come, I'll come, come to this in a second. Uh, some of the interesting options are the Chairman's Reserve Spice Room, which sells for about $25 a bottle. That's, uh, I think that's available in Louisiana. It's got a lot of depth. It's pretty interesting. And I'm actually fond of the, uh, I'm pretty fond of the Old New Orleans spiced rum, which has some uh, cayenne pepper in there. It gives a little bite at the end. Um, or you can make it yourself. I mean, it's not that difficult to make spiced rum. It's, you take a bottle of, of, of white rum that's not very pricey. You can use something that's pretty basic, like an Eldorado white or a Crucian white. Bacardi, I, I might steer away from just because I think it's a little too ethanolish. It doesn't have some, as much of the nat native rum flavor to it. You add a vanilla bean, you add some orange peel. It's been, the white pith has been removed. Throw in a cinnamon stick, throw in a couple allspice berries, four cloves, six black peppercorns, give it a little bite, pinch of uh, ground nutmeg, and then a slice of ginger about the size of a quarter. Just put that all in a bottle uh, or be hard to get that in a bottle, but use a mason jar or some other jar that's wide mouth that you can get everything in, dump a whole bottle of rum in there. Stir, you know, every once a day, pick it up, shake it around. After five, four or five days, start tasting it. If it tastes good to you, uh, strain it off. Uh, just pour it through a, a mesh strainer 
and get the spice in that. Then maybe add a teaspoon or two of sugar till it tastes a little bit of, like a liqueur. And uh, Bob's your uncle. You got yourself your own spiced rum. Be a nice thing to make up and give us a gift. Uh, be a nice thing to make up and drink for yourself. I know I've, I've done that plenty wise. We, uh, I think the first night I had that dark moon cocktail that was made with a spiced rum uh, with coffee and coffee liqueur, which is, I got another one the other night. It's a, it's a really good drink. I've been looking for a drink with spiced rum that I was enthusiastic about rather than something that just seemed like it was a way to, uh, to, to pass an evening. I mean, Captain and Coke is probably one of the great sellers of all times. It's not very interesting uh, drink to make. It goes down easy, but it doesn't have much uh, to keep my attention. Whereas this Dark Moon cocktail that we, we talked about first week, it does. It has a lot of uh, interesting things going on. So spice rum, huge market, often disdained because uh, it's, a, it's a frat boy, college kid kind of thing through shots of Captain Morgan. But it, uh, it can be sophisticated and interesting and it can contribute to your cocktail. So play around with it, see what you, what you can learn on that. The uh, flavored rums are related to spiced. Um, flavored rums seem to go through boom and bust cycles. People roll out some interesting flavored rum and it will, um, it will go through a phase where people are crazy about it and it will disappear shortly after that. Uh, and it disappears. Among the new flavors that I've seen rolled out just in recent months have been mango and passion fruit and banana and butterscotch. Uh, no comment on those. They, um, you, you're always going to find different flavor rums. Like I said, they are, they're along with spiced rum. They sell, they count for more than half of rum sales in the U.S. They tend to have lower uh, alcohol levels in them. Rum any spirit in the U.S. has to be at least 40% alcohol by volume in order to be labeled as a rum, scotch, whatever, what have you. Uh, but for uh, spiced rum, flavored rum, they're classified as liqueurs, and liqueurs can go a little bit lower. So typically we're at 30, 35%, sometimes as low as 25, 20%. Basically, they're, they're flavored rums, I think for many people, are just uh, bottled cocktails. Uh, you take them, pour them over a ice on a on a, over a cube and a glass and you're, you're ready to go. And you can maybe add some seven up or Coke to it. So they're, they're fairly simple. But the, uh, I do wanna mention this one. I think that we might start, we might be seeing some change in the flavored rum category. Uh, and that changes for the, I think for the better, almost all the flavored rums I've had, I, I refer to them as Jolly Rancher rums because they taste like a Jolly Rancher candy. There's just one note, it's like boom. Here you go, passion fruit, boom, mango, boom, strawberry, whatever it is that they're flavoring it with. They have some chemical house in New Jersey or Louisville, devise them a, a, a chemical compound that tastes something like what they're you know, trying to recreate, coconut or banana. Um, and you take a sip of it, and it's just not interesting. It just tastes like, like a Jolly Rancher. You pop it in your mouth, you go, wow, that tastes like watermelon. Uh, it, it doesn't actually taste like watermelon, it tastes like fake watermelon, which we've all been trained to think of as being real watermelon, but of course it's not. So a lot of this stuff, uh, the flavored rums are just cheaply made, poorly made, not very interesting to me. This one is uh, one that came out in 2011, and it, it's, I think, quite fascinating and really rich and complex. And it has, a, uh, has roots in New Orleans, uh, sort of after a fashion. It was created, like I said, in 2011 for a Tales of the Cocktail uh, panel or special event. Uh, it was hosted by David Wondrich, one of the great cocktail historians and, and innovators. And it was named uh, Stiggins after, as a tribute to a character uh, that Charles Stiggins wrote about in the Pickwick papers, uh, Reverend Stiggins, who liked his pineapple rum before he went to bed at night. Uh, so they decided to recreate a pineapple rum and they made it both with some fresh pineapple infusion. So they take the original uh, rum. I'm not sure which island they sourced this one from, but uh, a, a good solid sturdy rum and they would fill a tank with it and then put in chopped up pineapple. And that included not only the pineapple flesh, but also the skin uh, of the pineapple, which uh, had a, its own different kind of level of flavor to it. So it was uh, infused in there for a while and then uh, skimmed out. And it, uh, it, it went over very well in 2011, uh, Tales of the Cocktail. And so there's basically a clamor to bring it back. And so they, they did. It was popular enough that 
uh, plantation ran the numbers on it and said, well, I think we can sell this. And they have, and it's been uh, in production ever since. I think it's really solid. Uh, if you haven't tried it, tried it, you should. It makes for a great daiquiri. It makes for a lot of great uh, drinks. It's actually, the even sippable neat or on the rocks. It's, uh, it's a pretty impressive flavored rum. And I'm hoping that we'll see more that have taken this kind of care and, and, um, uh, and concern and, and, and creating a decent, good rum to uh, roll out to the public. So pineapple, it's the future. Well, it's actually the past, but I'm hoping it'll, it'll har be a harbinger for what's coming in the future. So we talked about mass market rums, basically party fuel, the white rums that go into the, the cheap punches and the garbage cans. We talked about spiced rum, we talked about some flavored rums. These are the ones that occupy um, liquor reps time primarily because this is the one they're s s selling most of, they're taking most orders for. Uh, but now let's go into the more specialized category of uh, what I think of as snifter rums, rums that you would uh, pour right into a glass, maybe with an ice cube, maybe not, depending on your preference. And these will compare right up there with uh, a good cognac, a good Armagnac, a great bourbon, uh, something that you you would be proud to serve to your friends. You'd be you'd love to have uh, sitting it out on a patio at night and, and the cold and the cool of fall, and just enjoy it, uh, sip by sip. And there's more and more of these, and uh, it's I still think they're really good value. Uh, especially compared to the price of uh, the higher marked bourbons and the scotches, which are typically upwards of $100. You can still find some really solid bottles of rum for, for under $100. So we'll, uh, we'll turn to that. And this, for me, has been the most interesting shift in the category since I've been following rum for about the last uh, two decades, is this, this movement towards really amazing rums that are uh, real standouts. I don't know, I think, I think the category just really in the last three to five years has started to emerge as to the more high-end ones, the ones that will go up over $100. I'm curious about whether rum will be able to, uh, to do that or not. Um, there's still a lot of baggage it's got as, a, as the party fuel, as the Bacardi thing. Um, but I think it's starting to shake that off and becoming much more sophisticated. Now, um, in, uh, in, in my book, which came out in 2006, I sort of lamented that rum was a bottom shelf thing, a sort of ne'er-do-well spirit that wasn't getting a lot of attention. But I thought that I saw that attention was starting to be paid to it. And the one rum that I really focused on in the book as being sort of a category leader and taking rum out of the gutter and into the great room was the Kappa rum. I had um, gone to... Uh, one of the first things I did when I was researching my book, I went to a rum festival up in Newfoundland in Canada, and uh, Zacapa won the best of show there. And at that event, they had retired Zacapa. They had the distiller there, and they put it in the Hall of Fame because it had won three years in a row. It was such a, a great rum. Nobody could possibly compete with it. Uh, everybody was uh, quite taken with it. So I, I really use this as an example of something that would be able to uh, take rum from one uh, category to another, to take it from, like I said, from the gutter up to the great rum. So it, um, it was, uh, unfortunately, you know, that book came out, like I said, 2006. When I redid it in 2018, uh, I, I completely rewrote that chapter, which was the last chapter in the book about uh, where rum was headed, because the rum category completely outpaced Zacapa. And I was getting grief from friends that were like, oh, really, Zacapa, you like that? Uh, it had sort of moved from being what I thought was the pinnacle of all great rums to being something on the mid, mid list, something a little bit further down. Some of uh, the things that happened with that were, um, well, Diageo purchased it, which was the first thing uh, about when my book came out. And they immediately, it was all, Zacapa was all 23-year-old uh, rum in there. They managed to, if, well, if you get to a little bit more about Zacapa. This is, uh, you know, their marketing shows that up above the clouds and the volcanoes, it's made in Guatemala, and it's distilled on the Pacific Plains. And then they, once they distill it, they're right in the sugarcane fields there. And once they distill it, they put it in trucks, and then they take it up to, I think it's 8,000 feet. 
uh, up in the mountains. They have warehouses up in the mountains. These are warehouses up in the mountains, which I visited, uh, I don't know, six or eight years ago. And they, the temperature up there is consistent 72 degrees, which is very much not tropical. So it, it, there's a more level, uh, more level uh, aging uh, environment there. It, it's not the spikes like you get in everywhere else, in the Caribbean and Mexico and the, in Kentucky. You get cold winters and hot summers. Here it's very, very consistent. So they would stash these uh, barrels up there for 23 years. And they used a um, fairly sophisticated system of blending, which they referred to as a Solera system. So they start with American whiskey barrels, then they would damp, empty those out in, uh, in a blend, put them back into charred barrels, let them sit for a while, take them back out and blend them, put them into sherry barrels for uh, you know, a couple of years. After that, they take them out and they put them in the Pedro Jimenez barrels and then finally take them out, blend them together and then bottle them as uh, Zacapa. The older lots up there, which up in the upper right corner, is their sort of form of the Solera system where they would take some out uh, along the way and let it age further and then blend it in along the way. So it was a pretty sophisticated system and I think it produced a pretty sophisticated rum. Like I said, some of the things uh, changed and my estimation of Zacapa seemed to be a little bit out of date within uh, the 10 years. Like I said, first was acquired by Diageo, this 23 year mark uh, that they claim, would claim on all the bottles and it was uh, 23 year. And in, in all spirits to be sold in the United States, if you have a year on it, if you have an age statement, even if you have a blend of five different barrels that have five different years, it has to be labeled with the youngest uh, rum on there. So if it says uh, rum age seven years, it might have some seven year rum, nine year rum, 12 year rum, maybe a little bit of 20 year rum in the blend, but it says seven year on the label. So Zacapa was labeling as 23 year rum. So the youngest rum they had in there was 23 years, which is pretty impressive. Uh, Diageo bought it, immediately took the 23 year statement off there because they ramped up their sales. And so it, um, it, it, they still have the big 23 on the label. It just, it, they claim that that's just their trademark or their branding. Uh, they're taking the word years off. I think there's a little bit of uh, misinformation going on there. They were just sort of using that as a way to keep up the perception that they were doing that. But it was a, um, they, they cut back their, their agents. I think the quality dropped somewhat because of that. Uh, and then the, the second thing that they were doing was that they, I think they, they were, I'm not positive, but I think they started adding more sugar to it to try to make it seem a little bit richer and fuller uh, with the less age on it. The, uh, I, I talked last week about the uh, dosage, the adding of sugar to rum, you can put some in there and that the, I believe it was the Kappa at one point at 40, 45 grams per liter, which was one of the highest in the category. They cut back to 25. I'm not exactly sure what they're doing now, but it's, uh, it tends to be very sweet. Uh, I know a, a friend of mine who runs uh, Latitude 29 in New Orleans, Jeff Barry, Beach Bum Barry. I, we talk, I remember talking with him about Zacapa once years ago, and he said, oh, no, he liked it. I like Zacapa. He said, I like it on a snowball, and it would be good on a snowball. So it's got that sweetness to it. So it's, um, yeah, I, I got so much ribbing about my fondness for Zacapa and the fact that Zacapa changed. That I, and when I redid the book in 2017, 2018, uh, I... I uh, took, mostly took Zacapa out and added in some of the new things that were happening on. And there are a lot of new and interesting things that are happening that are much more interesting than Zacapa. Zacapa is sort of becoming the mass premium rum, I guess. They're, that's how it's marketed. I mean, Diageo, as I said, largest liquor company in the world. They own Guinness Beer, a bunch of other huge products you'd be familiar with. And they, uh, they, uh, they, they've ramped it up so that I think they're taking some shortcuts to uh, production and it's changed the quality somewhat, but still a, a great rum. It's a great transitional rum. I would be happy to, uh, and I still do. Someone who tells you I hate rum, rum's disgusting. I had rum at my senior prom in high school. It did not end well. I'm not gonna drink rum again. Offer them some Zacapa, just a little bit, and they'll have a sip and think, huh, that's interesting. That's not what I remember. Uh, it's, it, it can still make a good bridge for somebody who claims they're not a rum drinker back into rum. But there are a lot of great other rums that have, um, have come out. So I want to uh, 
I talk about some of these other ones that are, are, are producing, which I, I sort of see in the Scotch model. Scotch, up until relatively recently, into the 90s, 80s or 90s, was always blended. It was a blend people would uh, just, producers would buy from different rum distilleries. They'd take some grain alcohol that's basically flavor neutral. They'd mix in some heavier ones. Uh, they produce this blended scotch like Cuddy Sark and Johnny Walker. And uh, it sold. It was fine. So it was a madman era drink, uh, the, the blended scotch. But sometime uh, not so long ago, they started to realize, well, they're single malts. Basically, the flavoring liquors, the flavoring whiskey that would go be mixed in with the neutral grain spirit to make blended whiskey was uh, just pulled aside. Some barrels were set aside and then bottled and sold as single malt uh, whiskeys. So single malt whiskeys came out. And people went, well, those are really good, much better than the blended ones, a lot more sophistication, a lot more character. And so that whole single malt, mar single malt market took off. I don't think anybody thought in the 1970s that you could sell a bottle of scotch for $125. And uh, it just took off and it became a whole category. And I see rum just in the last five years, I think is pursuing that same roadmap. They are looking at... Um, pulling off some of the rums that might be used for blending or might be used to water down with some cheaper rums to make it a decent product. They realize if you take some of these great rums off uh, the barrels before they get conscripted for lesser duty, then you can uh, sell them at a premium. I don't know that that is gonna catch on, but we'll see and I hope it does. I mean, it's, it is catching on right now. Uh, I just don't know if it'll take and if the economics will work for it, but I'm, I'm hoping it will. We'll talk about some of these uh, now. Start off with plantation. I will uh, start with a parenthetical here. Also, I, I, will, I will start off by telling you it's actually spelled plantation, not plantation. I, that's another typo there. <clears throat> but it's uh, just uh, a month or two ago, they announced they're changing their name because of the negative connotations with plantation slavery. They don't know what their new name is going to be, but they are changing it. So right now it's plantation. A couple of years from now, it'll be something else, just a, for a heads up on that. It's really one of the earliest in the field to start uh, bottling rare and interesting casks, doing the single casks. It's a uh, based in France. It's created, it's a company is called uh, Pierre Ferrand and they are noted for cognacs. And one of the guy named Alexander Gabriel, who was working for Pierre Ferrand and doing uh, cognac blending and cognac marketing and sales. Also spent time in the Caribbean. He got to know some of the places that were producing interesting rums. He was fond of rum himself. So he started uh, approaching some of these distillers and asked if he could buy, you know, some barrels, you know, 10 barrels, 20 barrels, whatever. Uh, and they would have them shipped back to France and have them rebottle or rebarreled into cognac casks. And then they would age further in France in the more temperate climate there to see uh, what would happen to them? What happened was was very good things. It was uh, he started releasing these sort of uh, single cask expressions that were uh, dated by year. Uh, this it was uh, it was a it's fairly he did this fairly quietly, uh, and it was uh, sort of word of mouth kind of thing. Here's some of the ones that were released last year. So he's got, you know, and it, it tells you right here, like Jamaica 2009, Long Pond. It's a very revered distillery that was shuttered um, a few years ago. It's been recently reopened, but it was closed down for a while. And it has sort of a cult following. So he found some barrels that were made at Long, Pro, Long Pond and then uh, further aged them in the, the uh, Toke wine casks. The uh, same with Panama, you know, 27 year maturation from a Panamanian rum, then finished it in a tealing whiskey cask. So there's a, a lot of interesting things he's doing here. Um, and these are uh, selling for, you know, as I just said, a premium. I'm not exactly sure what plantation is. I think 60 to 100, I'm gonna say offhand. I think that there's not much that's gone over 100, even these fine quality ones, it's a handful have, but uh, I'm, I'm not positive on that. But the, uh, so plantation, he's, uh, He's been, he's been out there uh, uh, buying these barrels and doing the extra aging. It took an interesting turn a couple of years ago when he, uh, Pierre Ferrand, bought a significant distillery on 
Barbados called the, the West Indies Rum Distillery. And it's, it, it's, it, it's a big industrial operation. It, per, it makes all the juice that goes into Malibu rum and some of the others. Um, but it all, he found that it, they had also all these old stills in there, including a, um, what was that one that he found? Sort of a Maryland rye style one, triple chamber, I think it's called. Uh, stuck in the back that had been taken apart and disused years ago. And he's got all these things he wants to play around with. So I think that's going to be really interesting. I'm not sure that he's, I'm not positive whether or not he's going to continue doing his traditional approach, which is to ship casks back to France and age there, or whether he's uh, going to be just focusing completely on producing and aging in the Caribbean. He also was, uh, and that purchase also involved a one third purchase of the Long Pond Distillery, which I referred to. Uh, in Jamaica, uh, as I said, a very revered distillery, and he's got a share in that. So I think there'll be some interesting stuff coming out from Plantation. Again, this will be more like the Scotch, Cognac, Armagnac vein of things, real sippable, nice uh, things. So the um, next one is the uh, Four Square Rum out of Barbados. Um, this is... Uh, a seal family, R.L. Seal, uh, was the uh, merchant who, who started off in the, I think it was the 19th century, might have been early 20th century. But the, he, he, he was a trader he, and a merchant. He bought and sugar and he also bought and bottled rum. Uh, the sugar plantation they acquired dates back to 1720 on Barbados. It's mostly sugar focused. Uh, and then, he, like I said, he would buy and blend rum and sell it that way. In 1996, his family, his descendants, uh, opened their own distillery, quite a modern, large distillery amid the sugarcane fields. And it was, uh, they, they produced a significant quantity of rum there. And a lot of this is for wholesale markets. As I said, um, it's common that distillers will produce a white rum, they'll put it in tankers, ship it over to Amsterdam. And in Amsterdam, it is uh, then sold by brokers. There's a brokerage company called EA Shear, which is a uh, leader in the field. And they have shares or they have tanks and tanks of rum or access to rum from all over the world. And so you can, if you want to start a brand, you can approach EA Share and they'll send you a box with a dozen samples and you can try your own blending and, and mixing and seeing which ones you like. And then uh, they will send it to you. And uh, Foursquare has provided quite a lot to EA Shear. But at the same time, uh, Richard Seal, the current uh, Seal, who's, who's running the, the distillery and overseeing it, has started some really interesting projects where he's setting aside some of the rum that he is uh, keeping as his, what he's called his exceptional cask series. So he's been keeping some barrels in there, but instead of sending these aged barrels off to a broker to be sold to others, he uh, has been bottling them himself under the uh, Foursquare uh, label. Many of these are aged for at least 12 years. I think one of the recent ones was just a 10 year release. And they're, uh, they're really quite exceptional. He's got a really good palate. They have a really good production system there. And uh, he's just keeping some of these casks set aside uh, that when he finds a really good one, it keeps it set aside for those who are willing to pay some of the, uh, the price for it, some of the more expensive ones. He also has the only other one he has a public interest in is real McCoy rum, which you'll see more commonly. It's a little bit more of a, a mid-range rum, but also very good. Uh, but that one also is uh, RL Seal and Company. So uh, keep an eye out for some of these when you're out in the four square exceptional cask rum. They're uh, again in the Armia Cognac category, something you just really, you're not mixing this with Coke. You're just sipping this in a snifter. So, uh, Somewhat related to that is uh, Habitacion Velier. Now this is a, it was two distributors of fine spirits. It was uh, La Maison du Whisky in France and Velier in Italy. They formed a new partnership in May, 2017 uh, called Maison Velier. And uh, they have different imports that they're working on together. Similar model to Plantation where they've uh, gone around this is again, so Luca Gargano, uh, who I mentioned is the Gargano classification system. This is his company, his project. He's been in the field for quite a while. In the 1980s, he was a 27 year old spirits entrepreneur. And he bought into a small family farm, a small family firm of importers of liquor and uh, 
that had been founded in 1947. It wasn't doing that much. He uh, got a share of it and really started shaking things up. He had previously worked with St. James Rum and Martinique, and so he understood a lot of the ins and outs of rum to this company that was uh, uh, importing, I think, wines and, and uh, other, other spirits, but not necessarily focused on rum. But beginning in the uh, 1990s, uh, he really started focusing in on bottling some of these foolproof vintage rums that he found around the Caribbean, including the Damaso Agricole rum from Guadeloupe. Um, and after that, he uh, started making some connections, which basically allowed him to raid the rick houses of some of the better distilleries, including uh, the Demerara distilleries in, in Guyana, which makes El Dorado. He got basically uh, access to go in there and sample some of the casks and decided which ones he wanted. And he would grab a bunch at a time and, and uh, take them and bottle them up and sell them uh, as fine rums. And it really it grew from there. He now sources from 15 distillers in several locations. And he's got um, distillers that he works with in Guyana, Jamaica, Barbados, and Marie Galant, uh, one of the French islands. And rather than blending for consistency, which as I've mentioned is sort of the normal approach in the rum world, he let, lets each cask stand on its own. He bottles uh, them in, they're all cask strains, they're all barrel proof. Uh, rums, and he bottles them uh, you know, by which year it was distilled, so that you have an idea. And the the uh, yeah, I, I like that. He's upfront about that. So which one, what year it was distilled, and then what I, I like at these illustrations on each of these labels the, the, of stills. These are not clip art that he found online. These are actual <laughs> replications of the stills on which they were distilled. So you really get an idea. Um, over in the left, the Barbados, you can see it's a mix of column and, and pot still. Um, the last ward, the Barbados rum, you see that's just a, a pot still with a double retort. Hamden, same as a Barbados. And then Privateer, which is a Massachusetts rum that they recently acquired some stock from, is a hybrid still. We talked about some of those last week. But I'm, uh, I'm impressed with the uh, Habitation Vellier line. Uh, again, this is... You, you're not allowed to mix this with anything. You can just sip it as it is. It's, it's a really delightful rum. So keep an eye out for these. You, you, you see these crop up once in a while. The, um, the other one to keep an eye out for is Caroni. This is also Luca Gargano production. This is one of the more fabled rum distilleries. It opened in 1918 on the island of Trinidad. It was uh, it was a massive rum and sugar, mostly it was sugar, it later did rum, became a huge rum producer, uh, grew the sugar, refined it, made rum from the molasses. But the peak, this whole operation, 9,000 workers at it, and then it closed in 2002. Here was the, the warehouse uh, that had all the rum barrels when it shut down the Caroni warehouse, nothing very fancy. But a year after it closed down, Luca Gargano had got the word wind of the fact that there was a warehouse full of aging barrels and some of them had gone into the barrels back in 1974. So you're looking at more than 20 year old rums sitting there in this aging house. So he went in, uh, got access to it, found them, and he bought up all the barrels uh, and he's been gradually releasing them bit by bit every year. He releases a few of them out. They're uh, definitely a bottle of cask strength or give all the information is on the labels as they are in the other uh, Habitat and Bellier ones, and it's, they're they're very hard to to come by. When they first when we first started doing this about uh, 20 years ago, you might find a bottle of Caroni for 30 or 40 dollars on the shelf. Now, when you can find them, they tend to be 400 dollars and up. Some uh, bottles for as much as a thousand dollars for a single bottle. So, as you're prowling liquor stores, if there's dusty old bottles on the shelf, you see a bottle of Caroni, I'd get it. Uh, See what, see what you can find out there. But so, so those are the, some of the four, the four rums that are, are really, like I said, the snifter rums, the ones that you want to just have alone with nothing else after dinner, maybe a cigar, maybe some chocolate, uh, and just enjoy them and sip them. Uh, these are really amazing rums. So that's, that's, we've talked about the mass market rums, we've talked about the, within the, the larger producers, some of the higher quality rums that are being separated out and diverted to uh, the, the aficionados and connoisseurs. Uh, now let's, I'm going to move on to another style rum, 
well, not necessarily style, but another category rum that's fairly new, and that is craft rums. Craft rums have just exploded in the last decade or two. When I was researching and writing my book uh, around 2005, 2004, there were only two craft rum distilleries in the United States that I knew about. There was Old New Orleans rum, it was then called Cane Rum, in, uh, up on Frenchman Street, up uh, uh, further up past the uh, Lowe's in New Orleans. And that was founded in 1995 by James Michaelopoulos, the artist who's well known for his, his streetscapes and his paintings of musicians. He, uh, he started that in 1995 because there was just a lot of sugar cane around. He thought, why not? He had, he had some money to spend on it. Uh, so he was the first in the U.S. to do it. The second one was Pritchard's Rum out of Tennessee, uh, who, weird place for it, just down the road from the Jack Daniels distillery. But he, a uh, guy named Phil Pritchard, got a bug in his bonnet to start making rum. And he came down to Louisiana and brought tanker trucks full of molasses stuff and started producing there. And that was... Um, early 2000s, I don't remember exactly the, the year he started. I did note in my first edition of my book that I thought it was bizarre that there was no rum distillery in New England. I uh, thought this was a tragic oversight of marketing that given the prominence of rum in the history of New England, why hadn't somebody opened up a distillery and started making rum to capitalize on this heritage and tradition? Well, that's no longer the case. Uh, there are now at least a couple dozen rum distilleries in New England and more cropped up all over the, the country. Uh, when I, uh, two or three years ago, I was hired by a firm to compile a list of all the rum distilleries in the US that, who was doing rum production. Um, and I compiled the list. I only focused on distillers who were doing actually, who were actually focusing on rum. It wasn't just a side project that they were doing and you know, making whiskey or gin, but they would maybe make a few uh, runs of rum every once in a while and sell it on the side. These are the ones who were just focused on making rum for the most part. I came up with 217 distilleries. Uh, so I started my book uh, four, 12, 14 years earlier. There were two rum distilleries. They were up to 217 in the U.S. Uh, shortly after. It's a sort of amazing growth. Now, I'm not going to get into much debate over the definition of craft what's craft and what's not. That is a rabbit hole from which there is no exit. You can, people debate them over the size of the distillery, over the ownership of the distillery, whether the owner himself or herself turns the switch that runs the still in the morning, how much hands on there is in it. Generally, I think craft, you know it when you see it, you know it when you visit it. Generally, they tend to be smaller, even if they are owned by a larger firm, that larger firm might give them uh, leeway to do what they want to do, and they run by people who care. And generally, I think if, if they've been founded since two, the year 2000, they, they tend to be more on the, the craft side. And, and importantly for me is that they, they experiment. They are willing to try new things. They're willing to try to innovate. It, it, uh, often they'll produce a flagship brand, uh, the one type of rum, but then they'll produce all different other types of things uh, on the side. They're, the owners, the distillers, they just want to try and they want to experiment, they want to play around with things. This is great for marketing, I think. It makes sense because it builds a con consumer base that's curious about what you're up to next. They just want to know what you've got in the pipeline. Uh, if you're releasing three, four, five different new products every year in limited edition, that's going to keep their attention. But it's also good, I think, for the producers themselves. It keeps the distillers active, interested, curious. They're trying different things. They're not just settling into a nine to five job of producing the same old white rum and the same old aged rum uh, every day. So they, uh, I, that's when I, when, I, when I travel around, I'm always looking at those things, you know, size, ownership, and experimentation. One of the, uh, you know, one of the fun things that has been watching this, I feel like my job, I started writing about craft spirits uh, 15 years ago. 20 years ago, and I was, I felt a little bit like I was a crusader. I was like trying to get people to pay attention to craft rum and craft whiskey and other things. So they looked at this old group of people, it's starting to come up and they're doing great stuff. You should pay attention to them. 20 years later, I'm now, I feel like I'm the bad cop. There's uh, 2000 craft distilleries. I mean, beyond rum, there's the gin, vodka, whiskey. And now I'm, I, I feel like I'm policing and finding a lot of those, of those 2000 new distilleries, a lot of them are producing really bad products. So now I sort of feel like I'm the, the Grinch that I'm going around and trying to, to find the places that are doing the good stuff and, and call to heal the ones who are 
just just sort of faking it and and, and doing it. I'm, I'm I mean, it's one of the fun aspects of, of writing about this and working on this is looking for these these golden eggs in the in the field of straw. There's some great stuff out there, uh, and I'm constantly tasting and constantly trying things. And I'm, and I'm constantly appalled at, like I said, some of the bad stuff. I'm, I'm always amused at distillers who've been gotten into the business. They bought a still. They've done a few runs. They've been doing it for six months or 12 months, whatever. And they're very dismissive of the major producers. They're like, oh, they're just big industrial producers, big, big corporate America producing this, this whiskey. We're, we're, we're handcrafted and we're tiny. And so you should buy us even though we cost twice as much. Which their product is horrible. It's some of the craft stuff is just not potable. It's just, I mean, you you don't figure out how to make a rum in a year. I mean, some of these big people, Mount Gay's been around for 300 years nearly. Uh, all of these big distillers have been around for a long time. They figured some stuff out in the last 100 or 200 years about how to make a good rum. The craft distiller, just because they're small, because they're handcrafted, because they They've got Carhartts on, does not make them a top-notch producer. So what I think craft can bring to it, just to circle back around, is that they can bring in, like, they can't compete. I mean, one of those things, a great consultant in the field who died last year, Dave Pickerel, always used to say to distillers who want to get in and make whiskey, you can't out Maker's Mark, Maker's Mark. In other words, you can't, you could produce a product that just as good as Maker's Mark, but you're still going to lose because they have economies of scale, they have access to distribution, they have marketing budgets that you can't even dream of. So you'll always lose to them. What you have to do is bring something else to the table. Don't bring Mount Gay, don't bring Bacardi to the table, bring a rum that stands out as distinctive, interesting, and makes people uh, want to try it and, and talk about it. So the, um, the small guys that are doing a good job of that do a good job. They can release a single barrel as if it's something that's their, their friend, someone they've known for a while, because they have. They've, they've seen this barrel age and mature over the course of four or five, six years, and they're really happy when it goes out. They can do a blend of three, four, five barrels. You know, when some of the big producers talk about small batch, they might be blending uh, four or five hundred barrels together at once uh, in a big tank and then it's like this is a small batch because normally they'll do far more than that so it's craft has got this ability to do things on a small scale they can release they can try an experimental product produce a barrel or two of it can release three or four hundred bottles of it if it sells it sells if it doesn't sell they'll get rid of it somehow and uh, it's not going to kill them. Where the big producers are never going to do something that small because there's just absolutely no reason for them to do it. They're only, they, I, I think that most of them figure if they can't sell 100,000 cases of a new product, they're not going to bother with it. They can't guarantee that they're going to sell that because there's, they've done all the market studies and focus groups on it. So anyway, craft has got a lot of interesting things going on. So I want to talk about some examples of, of great craft. Uh, Kohana Rum, based in Hawaii. They make a agricola, fresh sugar cane rum from sugar that they grow themselves. And they've been experimenting with a bunch of different sugar cane varieties, just as um, winemakers play around different grape varietals. These guys are growing their own sugar and, and using it just to make the, the rum. They're using some heirloom sugar cane that they uh, claim and believe that came from the early Polynesians that arrived on the island before it was a commercial crop that they brought sugar cane and grew it there. Uh, they found some feral stands, I guess, of sugar cane and believe that it, it, it can track it back to being some of the heirloom qualities, using that to make rum, uh, which is something that the big rum makers can't. So it's very, um, it's interesting, small scale, fascinating stuff. And it's a solid rum, tastes very good. And it's, uh, if you go to Hawaii, you should try to grab a bottle of that. I think there's some distribution elsewhere, but mostly Hawaii. <clears throat> I mentioned privateer in passing before. It's a small distillery based in Ipswich, Massachusetts. And I, I think it's producing some of the some of the best rums in the rum world today. I am a big fan of privateer. Some of their rums I think are just amazingly outstanding. Hasn't even been around for 10 years. So they've actually this is one of those golden eggs in the chaff that, that you find this stuff and I take a sip of it and you think, wow, where is this coming from? It's take, this, this could stand up with any of the old line rum distilleries in the, in the Caribbean. It's pretty uh, amazing. They produce a standard amber uh, shown here on the screen and, and a standard white rum that goes into a lot of bars. Both are very good. 
but they uh, are always working on limited edition bottlings, which uh, as I said, is, a, is key, I think, for an interesting craft distillery. Some of these are single cask selections uh, that they just, they, they're taste, they taste through all their barrels. When they taste one, they think, wow, that's really good. They'll set it aside and bring it out as a distiller's drawer. Um, I think it's what they call their limited edition series. So far they've released uh, 105 different distillers drawers bottlings. And these tend to be one cask, which means it could be maybe 150, 200 bottles per run. And the, uh, the notes on the website for each of these is, are sort of fascinating. They tell you all the conditions about these rums, uh, what kind of barrel they were in, how the barrels were stored, what, the, you know, what kind of temperatures there were in the winters uh, during which the barrels were in the warehouses, how hot or humid the summers were. Uh, whether they were double pot still or whether uh, it, it went through a column as well. All sorts of information on these, but they're, uh, they're, they're all really top notch. Some of the uh, more interesting ones I think have been their sea smoke, which uh, they use scotch casks for barrel finishing and they do a 114 proof or a navy strength, uh, double pot still white rum, which is uh, super flavorful. They also have a, a cognac cask finished rum. So these are, these are great. They are, um, if you get up to Massachusetts, they're, I don't know, 45 minutes north of Boston. A lot of their stuff's available in their showroom and also in uh, some of the liquor stores around Boston or also in New York, California, Illinois, handful of other states, I think maybe five or six, not that many. Not in Louisiana, not for my lack of trying and pestering them and asking them to get down to Louisiana, but so far I've not been that lucky for it. Lucky of getting them to come down here. But speaking of Louisiana, another one that I think is great to try, uh, craft rum. These guys I like a lot. Roulezon rum, they're in New Orleans. They are um, up on uh, MLK and, and Broad, or where uh, Napoleon, you know, ends. It's like I think Idea Village, there's a cidery there. A few other things there. Uh, small little distillery, two guys, uh, one of whom used to work at a distillery in Brooklyn and he came down to New Orleans, found the space. He brought, he actually bought some of these, these tiny little stills uh, from the distillery in Brooklyn and he brought them down with them. They were upgrading and so he took their cast offs. So these tiny stills, I think they only do like, I think my recollection is that maybe 19 gallons at a run is what they do on these pot stills. They have several of them, so they can do a few at the same time. And then they use small barrels, might be you know, 10 or 15 gallon barrels. Uh, for aging, uh, I'm always very hesitant when I see small barrels because there's usually a lot of bad spirit that comes out of small barrels. The concept is that it'll age faster because it's uh, the liquid to wood surface ratio is higher and so you get more wood flavor more quickly. However, as we talked about last week, there's two components of aging. Part of it is getting the wood flavoring as if the barrel is a big tea bag. The other part is allowing the, the, the distillate to intermingle with the oxygen and other elements that get into the cask through the wood pores. Uh, and over time that creates uh, a lot of interesting flavors. If you use a small cask, you're gonna get all wood, but none of the other flavors. Uh, but there are ways of, um, of uh, hijacking that process and making it work for you. And those guys, these guys have worked it through and figured it out. If you take what they call narrower cuts off of still, some of those elements that you'd want time to displace, you can just uh, cut them out at the beginning so you don't have to worry about time uh, breaking them down and, and dispersing them. Uh, they do a great job. And they, they also do uh, some experimental stuff as well. They have an excellent uh, rum-based Amaro, an Italian bitter uh, liqueur, which I think is, uh, is really outstanding. It's very, very nicely done. They've also acquired some fresh sugarcane juice in the last couple of years and, and uh, rushed it down to the distillery. As we mentioned last week, you have to distill it within 24 hours or it starts going sour. They've rushed it down to the distillery and, and uh, made some agricole rum, which I think is uh, really, it's quite solid. It's quite, quite uh, credible. And uh, like I said, these guys have only been around since 2017. They're young. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do as they grow. So they are, among the, there's just a handful of the craft people of the, uh, I think the ones that are really doing a great job. There's, there's plenty more. As I said, though, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of bad craft. So it's, it's a, it's a treasure hunt. You just have to look for the great ones. And if you hit a bad one, make punch and move on. 
um, don't worry about it. The, um, I think for the one thing I'm, I'm going to say on the, uh, the craft rums, a little concerned that the, uh, with the COVID pandemic that they're really getting hit. I think there's going to be a lot of shakeout in the, the field. The craft rums, I mean, everything moved from bars, every bar basically shut down across the country. And these craft products, these smaller scale products are really dependent on bars because the, these, this is all a hand selling proposition. Roulezon, Privateer, these guys are not going to be doing multi-million dollar ad campaigns in, in Vanity Fair and on the Super Bowl, try to get sales out there. They rely on word of mouth. <clears throat> they events like Tales of the Cocktail uh, canceled this year, which is where these distillers can mingle with bartenders. There's what, 15, 18,000 people come to town for this. Uh, they can get the word out, they can get some sample bottles to bartenders. The bartenders then will talk to their customers, say, oh, you gotta try this really on rum from New Orleans, it's really interesting. That's how they get their sales. That dried up, everyone went to the stores, and they went to the uh, big uh, markets to get their, their uh, liquor. They went with comfort liquor. They went basically with, with uh, Jack Daniels or, or with, with Bacardi, with Mount Gay things that were just familiar to them. So the craft producers have really taken a hit uh, since last March. So I, uh, I, I feel for them and I encourage everybody to seek some of these out and uh, give them some of your money. Let, let's, let, 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 let's, let's help them get through to the other side so they can resume what they're doing. I think they're keeping the big guys on their toes and they're making life more interesting for those of us uh, who really like rum. So that's uh, some of the craft rums. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more now. So talk about three distilleries. Remember travel? Travel was cool. That was fun while it lasted. Um, the uh, let's talk about three. There's rum distilleries are, are a lot of fun. You learn a lot at them. You get to sample. They're great. And here are three that I just want to recommend. If we ever get back on the road, here are three that you should put on your bucket list. First, uh, Rum JM. Uh, it's based in Martinique. Actually, all of Martinique is worth visiting. There's, there's uh, seven operating distilleries on Martinique, all, almost all of them making rum agricole, uh, and they're beautiful. They're great. De Paz is spectacular. Clement, uh, you don't actually see production at Clement. They have a historic distillery. So they've converted to an art museum, which is spectacular. Uh, rum, um, St. James is, is beautiful. Nissan is a little family-run distillery. It's great fun. Anyway, Martinique is great, but Rum Jam is amazing. It's got this sort of Shangri-La quality. It's up on the north end of the island. Uh, you wind up this small road and you come around a bend and this is what you look down on in the valley. And there's a river running down through it. You can't see it here, but there's a big volcano, uh, the Mount Pele that runs, that extends up uh, nearly a mile high behind this. And the slopes all the way up, uh, you know, about a third of the way up the volcano where all sugar came. So they actually, everything here is based on gravity. They've got their sugar cane they cut up in the fields. They haul it down by tractor. It goes into this complex to the left uh, where it's dumped. It's crushed. The juice comes out. They do a 24-hour um, uh, fermentation. Then it goes right to these uh, two column stills and comes out. Here are the uh, old column stills at JM. Uh, you get a little view of the bubble caps. I've talked about the perforated plates on the inside. We won't get into the uh, nitty-gritty science of and geekery of all this, but the shape of the bubble caps where you have the, the, the vapor, the steam uh, containing the alcohol percolating upward, the shape of that can change how much goes, gets recycled back in. Um, beautiful stills, uh, been around. They have to replace them every once, uh, parts of them once in a while. When I was visiting last year, the year before, they were, had cranes in there and they were dropping in the tops of uh, one of these back on here. They. Um, this is uh, Nazar Canatus. He is the master uh, distiller there. He has been there for nearly 40 years. His father was there for almost the same time. His father started working there in 1930. So between the two of these guys, got nearly a century of knowledge about how to make this, this rum uh, from sugar cane juice. He's a uh, fascinating guy. And uh, I believe he's still there. I don't think he's retired. This picture was from two years ago. So, um, I, uh, I, yeah, it's, it's well worth going. One of the other things that JM does, which is a little bit different, is they have a process they call oulage, which is that every, I think, five or six years, they take all the barrels from one year. So if, uh, you know, we're in 2011, they take all the barrels from uh, 2016. I mean, we're 2020, all the barrels from 2015. 
dump them into a big vat, and then refill the barrels. So they basically, because of the angel share, you lose about 5% uh, to evaporation every year. So you know, after five years, you're down 20, 25%. Uh, no sense having barrels that are only uh, uh, three quarters full. So they empty all the barrels out and then refill them so they're all filled up to the brim, feel it freeing up some other barrels. Uh, here is the, the process of uh, so I dumped it. I just like the fact that there's a distillery and they still have like an old rubber tire on the ground which they drop the barrels onto because you know what? That works. And why would you want some fancy ramp system when you could? Uh, dump the rum right in there and then drop the barrel onto an old tire and roll it out for, for refilling. Um, so that's, uh, that's JM uh, and Martinique, highly recommended. Second one I would recommend, uh, Hamden Estate in Jamaica. The, uh, I mean, the, uh, the uh, I will go, let me go back for a second and just say about um, uh, JM and Martinique, they, it was bought in 20, 2002 by Clement, which is another big producer uh, based in France that's on Martinique. And they, uh, they've done a good job of basically leaving it alone. Uh, they added a nice visitor center where you can go in and sniff by, you know, compare things by aroma, the different elements of the room. But for the most part, they've done a really great job of not messing with success. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit, it feels like you're in the past, but also there's something fairly modern with it. Hamden Estates, on the other hand, completely in the past. You're lost in time when you're at this. This is one of the more remarkable distilleries I've ever visited. I went in 2016. So a group of rum uh, geeks, rum experts and writers, and we were trying to figure out how their dunder system worked. It's, uh, it's something that Jamaica's famous for and how they get some of that funk into their rum. It's also uh, a little bit mysterious, unsanitary, and completely disgusting, uh, but remarkable. So Hamden Estate was established in 1753 uh, when there was, you know, insatiable demand for sugar uh, around the globe. And, uh, made a fortune for proprietors over a course of a century or two, but then there were bumps in the road. And among them, 1889, Germany figured out, um, or they boosted tariffs that were of Jamaican rum coming in there. Uh, the man fell, that forced them to uh, sort of get clever about that. There's also the rise of the sugar beet industry, which produced you know, reduce the demand for, for sugar in Europe, uh, demand for Caribbean sugar in Europe. So, but with the, uh, in the late 19th century, with the encouragement of the guy was then the Jamaican Minister of Agriculture named Herbert Henry Cousins, uh, the rum producers sort of refined their techniques for producing high ester rums, really stinky, big, fragrant rums, with the idea being that they could pack more flavor into a smaller amount of fluid and thus would be less uh, subject to duties. Uh, when they were exported, so that uh, a buyer in Germany or France could could uh, bring in the rum, but then dilute it down uh, with some uh, sugar beet product or the like, and still have a really interesting rum. So these dense, uh, funky rums really became at that really took off around the end of the 19th century, uh, and they there's a lot of uh, attempts of trying to figure out how to do this very high ester rum. The uh, it was popular through much of the 20th century. It was a sort of distinctive, interesting rum. But, you know, things started fading, I think, in the mid 20th century. People were moving towards lighter products. Vodka was ascendant. Lighter rums like Bacardi were ascendant. The dun funky, dense rums of Jamaica were not. It started to decline in the 1990s. The uh, Jamaican government had to start extending loans to keep the sugar and rum works afloat around the island. And in 2002, the island, uh, the owners of Hamden State just defaulted on the loans and started uh, and walked away from it. So in 2002, the Jamaican government took over it, did, just kept it barely going. 2009, the Jamaican government decided to get out of the rum business and they auctioned off their products. Um, auction off the estates that they had, including Hamden Estate, and the winning bid here went to the Hussey family. They'd been around since the 19th century, running farms. They had a big dairy operation. They provide a lot of the milk and butter to Kingston, Jamaica, uh, and they ended up getting uh, this along with some other uh, sugar lands nearby. They ended up with like 7,000 acres of uh, of sugar. So they um, were mostly interested in the sugar lands and the sugar refinery that they acquired at auction. The rum distillery, the Hamden rum distillery was sort of less interesting. Uh, so they passed it off to uh, 
uh, Christelle Harris, who was the granddaughter of the man who's then running it. She was the uh, actress, aspiring actress. She'd been in California. She was in her 30s. She came home, you know, when her grandfather was dying, and uh, after he died, she stayed on to help the family figure this out. And she was sort of given the rum distillery and said, just figure, figure this out, figure out what we need to do here. She thought with a few million dollars, she could modernize it and bring it up to date. But first, she went on a listening tour of uh, clients in Europe, because most of the stuff was being sold, as I think I mentioned earlier, uh, to a broker who was just selling it wholesale. And he, she went and talked to a bunch of clients who were buying it, and they said, do not change anything. Uh, that this, this distillery was old and antiquated, and there's no way you could replicate it today. There was like mold in the wood, there was mold in the atmosphere and it created yeast. Uh, there were holes in the roof and that, that was bringing in stuff from outside. There were spiders in the, all over the distillery. And it's, don't touch the spiders, let the spiders do what they're doing. They're probably contributing somehow to the flavor. Uh, and it took Christelle about a year just to realize that, oh, I don't have to modernize. I just have to keep it going as it is. It really is like a 19th century rum distillery. And they've managed to stay, stay, the, stay the course. So uh, it's been great. It's an extraordinary place to visit. This is the, uh, some of the stills in the background, in the lower shot with the barrels. Here's the distill distillery house up above. Uh, when you go in, the, um, it's, 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 it's something. It's, uh, it's, it's right out of Dickens. It's just, everything's been cobbled together. Everything works. No one really is sure quite how. Uh, and they do have the, uh, we found the dunder pits. You can't, we couldn't really photograph them. They actually didn't want us to photograph at all because I think they were afraid that this was not stuff that they wanted to get out into the public to show how, where their rum was produced in what looked like a, uh, uh, some sort of Tim Burton nightmare film. Uh, but the dunder pits were running underneath some of the fermenting tanks. What the dunder pits do is they would take some of the old uh, stillage from a previous batch uh, when it was done, dump it into the dunder pits. Most of these were indoors. We call them dunder pits. The Jamaicans call them muck pits. Um, most of them was indoors. Some of them they would put outdoors just to keep them out there. To It's basically like a sourdough starter or yeast. It would, it would stay alive. It would take on all these microbes. Then every once in a while, they'd take up some buckets full and put it into the still, uh, which would help bring out these different flavors, these funky flavors. It would uh, stress the yeast, uh, cause them to produce acids, which would then later... Uh, esterify into something uh, interesting flavor. So these are the, uh, that's Hamden Estate. If you can get down to Hamden Estates, you should. Uh, one, a, uh, uh, I guess a caveat is that I went down, as I said, with a group of writers and we did get our tour of the distillery. I'm not sure that they let the general public in there. They have a nice visitor center and you get a tour of the plantation and the farms. But uh, Getting into the distillery is quite something. And if you, if you get a chance to get some of their rum, you should. A, f a third uh, distillery I think that's worth visiting, uh, another Hamden shot. This is their old uh, double retort still. Dickens, Dickens all over. Uh, third one, a little more close to home, Georgia, Southern Georgia, Richland rum. I, uh, I like this place a lot. Eric Vaughn started this, uh, uh, I think about 20 years ago. And his focus is on single estate rum, which is what he calls it. And it's, uh, it's I think the guys in Hawaii I mentioned, at Kohana, and there might be one or two others that are growing their own sugar that they use for rum, but there's not many. Richland is one of them. Uh, Eric started experimenting. He spent about 15 years experimenting with different types of sugar. Uh, this is the, you go into the distillery. It looks like a standard micro distillery. It's got a more interesting story behind it. It's Eric and his wife and their sugar fields. He started experimenting with these, tried 17 different kinds of sugar cane strains before he settled on one that he thought worked best. Uh, and then he grows the sugar, crushes it, makes sugar cane honey. We talked about that last week. He melts down, not melts down, he boils down the sugar cane juice so it's thick and dense like a molasses, uh, like Steen's cane syrup. And then he can save that in tanks and distill all through the, the year. He also uh, bottles everything a single cask. So everything comes from, uh, Every bottle is just tapped into one cask. That means when you look at them, their colors can be different depending on what cask it came from. That is considered sort of a no-no when you're in the corporate world, when you're producing rum for mass markets because you want every bottle to look identical. But uh, I mean, this is, I think this tends to be more of a feature than a flaw 
uh, of these. If you see rums that are different colors, uh, and they claim to be single cask, that's sort of proof that they are single cask, that they haven't been, not necessarily proof, but a good indicator of that, that they haven't doctored uh, with color or flavor or anything or blending to make them more consistent. So he does a great job with that. I'm also fascinated by Richland rum because he's in this small town of Richland, Georgia. It was very much in decline. It was prosperous at one point. It had rail lines that converged there. It was an agricultural trade center. So farmers were bringing all their produce to be shipped onward. Uh, that all dried up with the rise of trucks and interstates. Richland has really been at a loss to try to figure out what to do. Uh, but when Eric came into town and sort of proposed some distilleries, the town embraced him. Uh, they've helped ease the process for him. He's got, I'm not sure how many buildings he has in town, but it's a bit of the downtown is now Richland and Rome, which I think is, is, is a neat thing. And it's, um, it's, it's all, to me, it's, all, it's interesting. I'm always interested in small town revival and renewal and Main Street programs. And this is an interesting case of that, of a distillery sort of helping to revive a, a town and find a purpose for it. He's been successful enough. He's also opened another distillery in Brunswick, Georgia, down on the coast. So Richland Rum's another one. I'm gonna now jump ahead. We've talked about distilleries to visit. We've talked about craft, some of the craft rums to look for. Uh, I'm gonna jump ahead and talk about three classic rum cocktails. The, um, I see, I see one thing that we won't be making is this drink that's pictured here, the one with the umbrellas and the multicolor and the straw coming out of it. This is, I think, what a lot of people think about uh, rums for the, for the most part, rum drinks, but I, I do not. I, I don't think that uh, they need to have umbrellas. They shouldn't be like this. These, these rum drinks, I think many people think of rum, when they say rum is too sweet, I think a lot of them think that because they have them with sweet mixers or sweet juices. And it's just like sweet, 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 all these different sweet things put into a drink. And of course, rum is going to taste sweet if that's the case. Um, I'm not going to, one of my three classic rum cocktails is not the pina colada, because I think the pina colada does not do rum justice. It tastes like pineapple and coconut. I like pineapple. I like coconut. I like them together. It's not a rum drink, though. I don't think you really can taste the rum in that. And uh, a little less, I'm a little less vehement about it, but the same with the mojito, which is uh, one of the most popular drinks uh, sold these days. I think it challenges the margarita for dominance in the bar world uh, as, in terms of number of drinks sold. But the mojito is its a refreshing drink. I love mint. I love lime. I love bubbly soda water. Um, its it, it doesn't, to me, it's not, it doesn't have the fullness of the rum in it all that much. You can, I mean, you can play around with different rums in it. Some will come through more than others. You can put more rum in it, it tastes better. But mojito to me is not, it's a great drink, but not one of the classics. So I'm gonna talk about the three that I think are uh, really the ones that everyone should have in their, their repertoire. The Daiquiri's been around since the late 19th century. It was created uh, near the town of Daiquiri in Cuba. It was probably created by a mining engineer named Jennings Cox, who was working for an American or British company down there. He uh, mixed up lime, sugar, and rum and uh, served it to friends. He was also quite the rock on tour and singer. Uh, when they come over and served them daiquiris in 1909, uh, a, a group of military officials showed up in Cuba to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the ending of the Spanish-American War of 1898, 1899. And uh, one of the guys on board was a medical officer named Lucian Johnson, and he met Jennings Cox and spent some evenings with him, was introduced to the daiquiri, became completely smitten by it. He brought it back, the idea of it back to the U.S., and brought it to the Army Navy Club in Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and elsewhere. Uh, it really took it to Was the Army Navy Club in Washington, D.C. It became sort of their house drink. They renamed their lounge the Daiquiri Lounge. Uh, and from there, it really grew and became sort of a classic drink. The idea that Daiquiri is some novel or fascinating, interesting drink is sort of curious in that it is a, uh, it's basically punch. We talked about punch the first week. It, it's got citrus, it's got sugar, it's got rum. Uh, it doesn't have a spice that uh, the rums, uh, the punches usually have like nutmeg, but it, uh, it, it well, the, one, the other thing it has that didn't, that the traditional punch didn't have was ice. And ice is a you know, key part of the daiquiri, I think. So you want it, you want it to be really cold. Some people get a little uh, butthurt about the, uh, if there's little ice crystals floating on top of their daiquiri. 
I, uh, I am fully in favor of the little ice crystals. I like them when they bump into my lips for the first few sips. Uh, so I, when I make it, I, I usually shake it with uh, both full cubes as well as uh, crushed ice that leaves some of the, the shards on there. Daiquiri is super simple, but also it's really complicated to make perfectly. Limes tend to be different tartness and sweetness and flavorful to certain levels during different times of the season. So you have to compensate for that. You want to get the sugar just right. And it depends on what sugar, you can use a Demerara sugar, simple syrup. And there's also the whatever rum you pick, which obviously plays a big part of it. White rum is usually good in daiquiri. Occasionally I'll feel like an aged rum, but the oak flavoring is, is not so great. So um, yeah, learn to make a daiquiri. My way I do it, I take a, a lime, cut it in half, squeeze half a lime into a, uh, a jigger. And then I'll add, say that that might produce a half an ounce of lime. I'll then do a little less than that of simple sugar. So just short of a half an ounce. I don't like the one to one ratio. I like a little less, not quite two to one uh, lime to sugar, but somewhere in between. And then uh, two ounces of rum and then shake it. If, if you're in New Orleans and you happen to have a lime tree or know someone who has a lime tree, here's a pro tip. You go out, you grab two or three lime leaves off the tree, throw that in the shaker, beat those up with them as well. There's uh, some really nice oils in the lime leaves. And they bring an extra bit of flavor to your to your drink. The, uh, so that's the daiquiri. Should, everyone should, have, if you're into rum, you should really be able to master the daiquiri. Second one that I would go with is the rum old fashioned. It's sort of one of the original cocktails with spirit, sugar, bitters, and ice. It's more popularly known as a whiskey drink, of course, but it goes super well with, with rum. I like this because it really does showcase the rum and a rum old fashioned made with a uh, plantation rum versus something like an Appleton are completely different drinks. And they really, it really does showcase the rum. Uh, and you can vary the bitters as well. You know, it's amazing what one or two drops of different kinds of bitters will do to, to this drink. So it's, it's, a, it's a great showcase for rum. Uh, and the sugar it just takes a little bit of the edge off. It's a little bit more friendly. It's a little less up in your face and challenging. It doesn't get in your grill. So it's a, um, another one that I think you should play around with and really nail. And then finally, the third one is the tea punch, which is the Martinique drunk drink, which is what I'm having tonight. It's the classic drink of the French islands. It tends to be served there very informally. It's really more of a process than a drink. When you order a tea punch, they'll bring out a bottle of rum, put it on your table. They'll bring out a little bowl of ice. They'll bring out some sugar. It might be a little carafe of simple syrup. It might be some granulated sugar. And they'll bring out a bowl of some lime pieces. And you make your own. You decide how much rum you want in it, how much lime how much sugar. That's all it is. It's basically a French rum old fashioned. Uh, but I love the ceremony of it when I'm in Martinique and I love the taste of it. My, you know, my preference is the Nissan rum uh, from Martinique, uh, the 100 proof, if you can find that. It's, it's really great. The, um, so just briefly, where to find rum for New Orleans for bars. These are four that I recommend, Latitude 29, famous for tiki drinks. Uh, Jeff Barry has been doing research on these for 25 years, and you can uh, taste the results of his research there. Cannon Table on Decatur Street. Uh, consider itself a proto tiki bar. They have a lot of rums from early, I uh, mean, rum drinks that were sort of pre-tiki, but a little bit tropical, a little bit uh, Southern. Uh, very good rum selection. Manolito, tiny little bar. Uh, but they have, if you start to strike up a conversation with a bartender and you express an interest in rum, they'll start pulling out some interesting things. You can get like a Paranube daiquiri made from a Mexican rum that's really quite fascinating. And the Palace Cafe uh, on Canal Street has the Rum Runners uh, bar upstairs in the back. Great selection of rums there. Uh, you can try them straight or with drinks. And they have a rum club there. If you uh, sign up, you get on the email. And once a month, I'll send an email. There's a free shot every month of some different kind of rum that you can go try out. Of course, most of these bars are shut now. I'm hoping soon they'll be reopened. Canaan Table, available. Um, that's open. Manolito, you can sit outside. Anyway, things change week to week. Who knows? Where to buy retail? I think these are not going to come as a surprise to many of you, except for the last one. Dorniax and Mattery, Keefe & Co., on Howard Ave downtown, Martin's Wine Cellar, Metairie and uh, Uptown, all have, have solid selections of rum. Louisiana is not great for its uh, offbeat rum selections because it's 
the distributors just aren't interested in bringing things in for a small market of just a handful of people want it. But if there is stuff that you want, just be sure to ask. Like go to all these places and ask for it so that they know it's on their list. And they can, if the stores, the re retailers start asking the distributors about certain kinds of rum, they might start paying attention. And finally, Hong Kong market. Not a great rum selection, but sort of bizarre one over on the West Bank. Uh, they've got a really interesting selection of liquors in the back, and sometimes I see some interesting rums there that I'm not expecting. Um, and then online, uh, try Benny's in Chicago. Uh, some people have had luck getting delivery to Louisiana. I think it depends on the day. WhiskeyExchange.com and PlanetRum.com. Both of these are in uh, England, so it's sort of ruinous to order from them. I think uh, I looked at a you know, you get a, bot one, a bottle of four square rum for 60 bucks, which is pretty good at the whiskey exchange, but then the shipping from Europe was also 60 bucks, so it's not so good. Planet Rum has that thing where uh, the prices are pretty reasonable. Shipping's steep, but if you uh, order $500 or more, then it's free shipping. So if you've got some friends who want to form a little rum club, place an order, you could probably get in on the free shipping that way. I'm going to finish up with uh, five bottles that I think are worth owning. These are not I don't think the best bottles ever. They're not the, they're not the, they're not unobtainium of some of the whiskey people talk about, stuff that you just can't get anywhere. But these are bottles that if I someone said, we're putting you on a, a deserted island for, for six months, grab five bottles and take them with you. These are the five that I would I would probably probably take uh, just because they have a, a nice range and, and good quality. And also they're these are also affordable. I mean, I'm not talking about these rare. I'm not talking about some of these bottles of the, the Coroni that sell for $1,000. Would I take one of those? Have I had it? Sure. Am I going to spend that money? No, I'm not. So first, El Dorado five-year, very affordable. 20 bucks a bottle, uh, super supple, pretty sophisticated, great in a rum Manhattan. This is, uh, this is sort of my house rum, um, if I'm not delving into some other stuff. It's... There's, it's pretty flawless for a basic rum. I don't know why you would get something else. A little bit sweet, but not too much. It's pretty well balanced. So El Dorado Five Year, like I said, about, about 20 bucks a bottle. I've talked about Privateer uh, and their sort of exclusive limited bottlings, their uh, distiller's drawer. If you can find any of the distiller's drawer, it's probably worth grabbing. But if you can find the bottled and bond, it's definitely worth grabbing. Bottle and Bond is a category of liquor that is uh, it's distilled in the same season by the same distiller. And this is a definition that goes back to, I think, 1897. And it's, uh, it's bottled at 100 proof, and it's aged for at least four years. And their uh, Bottled and Bond New England rum is uh, extraordinary. And I think that sells for about $40 a bottle. Uh, if you can find it. They are not distributed in Louisiana. They are distributed in New York. I think you can get these off the Binney's website out of Chicago, if you can get them to ship down to Louisiana. Uh, well worth well worth tracking down. Any of the distiller's drawer. If you can't find distiller's drawer, they have a, a, their Navy rum, which is excellent, and the Queen's Share, uh, also excellent. Those two are, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Privateer. I, I like the distiller. Maggie Campbell, a young woman who's super bright and energetic and willing to try anything. And uh, her stuff that she produces is quite amazing. I mentioned Habitation Vellier. Um, if you can find some of the Hamden Estate, that would be awesome. Call me up, I'll come over and help you drink it. Funky, full, rich. Uh, don't be picky on the air. This one's the 2011 distillation, but any, uh, any, Hamden Estate one that you can find is worth doing. I talked about Hamden Estate, the, the, the rundown distillery. You can taste history in this bottle right here. It's one of the uh, higher priced ones. It's about, this is $100 a bottle if you can find it. It's, uh, it's worth it for special occasions, worth it for the, the history. I can say Valier is uh, just set up in New York, I think three or four years ago to start bringing in these these uh, cognac level rums, and uh, it's exciting to see what they're they're coming through with. So I think keep an eye out for it. Fourth one, Rum Nissan uh, from Martinique. This is a classic white agricole rum. 
lots of body, lots of flavor, lots of fruitiness and grassiness to it. Perfect in a tea punch. Uh, this is the first bottle I will always reach for in a tea punch if I have access to it. And uh, it's all over Martinique. It's pretty much the standard bottle you'll see on the tables and in bars and restaurants uh, when they bring out the tea punch makings. <clears throat> Nissan is great. Small family run distillery run by now by uh, Gregory Nissan, who took it over from his mom, who took it over from her dad. And they managed to keep it going and they keep doing interesting things. And it's, it's really quite extraordinary. So look for the rum Nissan. Um, I don't, I think you can get this in Louisiana. I'm pretty sure. I tend to pick it up where I see it when I'm traveling and come have bottles. And I don't happen to have bottles over here tonight, which is unfortunate. So I made it with the rum JM white, which is also good. And finally, this is fairly um, straight up rum. It's sort of the lighter Puerto Rican style rum. All the other ones, I, on my palate is that I like the heavier, denser rums, but I do every once in a while, don't feel like something that's gonna sit on my tongue quite so heavily and I'll, I'll pick up a Puerto Rican rum. And this Don Q Reserva 7 is really quite nice. The, um, it was released in July of this year. So it's just starting to make its way out through the markets. You should, it's um, uh, so a little bit of a tip if you can find it. It hasn't been quite gotten the, sort of into the, uh, the status of being something that people are, are actively seeking out yet. But it's a really solid rum, really good. It's one of those rums that's right in the borderland between sippable, you can put it in a snifter and sippable, or you can mix it up in a, in a, in a drink of some sort, in a, man, in a man, rum Manhattan or rum old fashioned or a jungle bird or a tiki drink. It would, it would do just fine. And so, like I said, it was just released this past summer. It's quite affordable, about $25 a bottle, if you can find it. should be available in Louisiana. So that's the five rums. And, uh, and here we are at four minutes till nine. So this concludes the audio portion of your rum tour. I hope that you have a glass in front of you and we'll continue the practical studies in rum. And if you have any questions, throw them at me. And otherwise, thanks for uh, tuning in for three weeks, those of you who survived it. It's a lot of talk about rum. All right, Wayne, uh, a couple things. First, uh, we have another, we have a El Pasador De Oro uh, drinking again and El Dorado 12. Um, and then a question on your thoughts on Barbancourt or any other Haitian rum. The, the any other Haitian rum is like opening a door to this huge, huge hallway. The, uh, I love Barbancourt. Barbancourt, I was, I was tempted to put Barbancourt on my list instead of the uh, Don Q uh, Reserva 7 because it's also a fairly light rum. It's made with sugar can syrup and it's made on with columns still. So it's a, it's a little bit lighter and brighter uh, than some of the heavier rums. It's a really good rum. I'm, I'm a big fan of rum barbancore. If I can find it, I will, uh, I will buy it. Um, I usually have a bottle on hand of barbancore around somewhere. The, as for other Haitian rums, the one that's interesting now is the Clarin, C-L-A-R-I-N, which is people refer to as sort of the mezcal of rum because mezcal, if you're paying attention to any of the Mexican spirits, there's tequila and mezcal. Mezcal is much more raggedy and rougher and, and, and bolder than tequila, which tends to be a little bit more refined. Same way that Armagnac is a little rougher brandy than cognac. Uh, the Clarins are coming, they're coming in from Haiti. Are, uh, they're, they're, they're up in your face. They're really assertive and aggressive, but they're really, really tasty. And they've got a lot of flavors in them. It's a little bit rougher, a little bit more moonshiny but they are good. Um, I, uh, and the same folks, the uh, Habitacion Valier is importing them. They've got, I think, five or six different uh, Haitian clarins that they're now importing. And you, I believe you can get those in Louisiana. So I think those are good. I mean, Haiti's got a long, rich tradition of rum production, and they tend to be a little bit less discovered than other islands. So it's some of the stuff that you find there is really good. If you find Barbancourt, do it. If you can get a clarins, also good. Okay, another question was about um, Havana Club. So um, the question is, is that you can you can find a cheap uh, Puerto Rican, I think it, they said it's a Puerto Rican Havana Club, but, but that's not the Havana Club that you get from Cuba. What, what is the difference between the two? Do we have another hour? <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> it's, uh, 
it's a long, it's a long story. It all goes back to Fidel Castro overthrowing the government in 1959 and the um, family that made Havana Club leaving the island not long after and then abandoning their rights to the trademark for Havana Club. The Cuban government took it over. Um, fast forward two or three decades and Bacardi approached the family that had fled Cuba in the early 60s and asked them about the trademark and they said they gave it up. And but so then Bacardi had the US government pass laws making it illegal to take that trade, take trademarks like that uh, from the family. And then so Bacardi claimed the trademark for Havana Club. It's been fought in US courts and global courts, trade courts. Uh, the upshot is, is that Bacardi has the rights to the Havana Club name in the US. That's not uncontested. The Havana Club gov uh, Cuban government and Pernod Ricard, which is the second largest liquor company in the world, which owns the distribution rights for Havana Club, contest that regularly. But uh, basically there's Havana Club in the US, which is made by Bacardi, and there's Havana Club everywhere else in the world, which is made by uh, the Cuban government and distributed by Pernod Ricard. So that's the difference. I'm not a big fan of the Bacardi version of the, the uh, Havana Club. It's fine, it's basic, it's not distinctive. The Havana Club from Havana, it's okay. I mean, it used to be, I think it used to be much better before Pernod Ricard took it over. And I think the same history has happened with Diageo and Zacapa. There were some shortcuts. I, I met the former distiller from Havana Club He's now in Panama, and I asked him what happened to Havana Club uh, in the uh, few years since uh, Pernod Ricard took over, and he was very diplomatic. He said, I think in Cuba they have a different calendar than you and I, so I think he's suggesting that the aging is not quite as robust or complete as it used to be. Um, uh, uh, Christine LeBronc says that restaurant uh, N7 has several good rums available. So for people out there looking for a place, and I saw they were open. So uh, 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 Helen Barksell says a white rum from Natchez is called Charbonneau. Yeah. Um, um, I've had that. I've visited the distillery there. And then Anna B says her personal favorite is Admiral Rodney from St. Lucia. So That's very good also. It's, it tends to be more, I think, I think of Admiral Rodney as more of a, a – uh, Guyana style rum, a Demerara style rum is pretty heavy and dense and sweet, but very, very tasty. I like Adam Rodney. Rodney. All right. Well, Wayne, well, we really appreciate you speaking for three weeks and uh, we learned uh, a ton and uh, thank you so much. Uh, multiple people are saying thank you as well. And uh, uh, we will be getting the emails out to everybody else um, with the recordings from the last couple of weeks. So thank you, Wayne. I appreciate it. And uh, um Hope to see everybody at one of our other events coming up uh, over the next couple months. Okay. Thanks for the invite to do this. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Everyone Wayne. drink well. Cheers. Cheers. Take care.